In the lecture that I'm going to deliver now, I'm going to talk about a fascinating, unique find uh, called the Pazaric Saddlecloth. And hopefully this uh, will give us a springboard uh, as a way of looking back through time and get a glimpse of what was going on uh, in the times of the Tanakh, in the times of the Bible. Uh, also, it has uh, uh, very important ramifications uh, regarding Tchelet, regarding the sky blue color, and uh, uh, the question of uh, what exactly is Tchelet, what exactly is the source, where does it come from, uh, and what was this beautiful blue dye that was uh, used uh, in ancient times. The um, find is a saddle cloth. As you can see, it has a, a, a beautiful pattern. That pattern is uh, Babylonian, comes from Bavel. In the center, there are uh, there's a, a purple wool dye, and along the edges, you can see the remains of a blue hem, if you will, around the edge, uh, border, a sky blue color. Now, the, um, the analysis of this wool shows the presence of not only indigo, but also a bromine compound of indigo, dibromo indigo and monobromo indigo. Uh, that can only be found in dye that comes from snails, uh, specifically from urex snails. And so uh, what we have here is a very, very ancient fabric, and this dates back to approximately the 5th century BCE. So we're talking about 2,500 years ago. One of the oldest fabrics ever found, certainly the oldest dyed purple and blue wool, and uh, this certainly came from a murex shell, a murex snail, the dye comes from the shells in the Mediterranean. The wool was presumably dyed there. Gets to Babylonia. That's where the pattern is. It was woven into this saddle cloth in Bavel, in Babylonia. And it ends up uh, in the burial mound of a prince of a tribe known as the Scythians, who lived in the Altai Mountains, which is... Uh, a region in southern Siberia, just north of the four-way border between Kazakhstan, Mongolia, China to the south, and Russia to the north. So what I'd like to discuss today is this find, and maybe we can understand a little bit uh, about uh, uh, some of the things that were happening in the times of Tanakh, some of the psukim in Tanakh, but the question that has to be answered, and I'm not sure that I'll be able to answer it, but I hope to give at least a theory, which is plausible. How did we get this wool that was dyed on the Mediterranean coast? How did it get to Bavel, to Babylonia, to be woven into a saddle cloth? And how did that saddle cloth end up halfway across the continent in southern Siberia and Russia? And I hope that uh, we'll find the answer to that in this discussion. So first of all, the Scythians. Scythians were known uh, in uh, Assyrian as Iskuzai, Iskuzai. Some people say that uh, when the Tanakh uses the word Ashkenaz, it's talking about these tribes, the Scythian tribes. What uh, we know about them, essentially we know from Herodotus, who lived in... Uh, Herodotus was a Greek historian. He lived in uh, the 5th century BC, 489 to 425 BCE. Herodotus is a great historian. He's actually known as the father of history. And what he knows about the Scythians was mostly gleaned from one Scythian traveler who ended up in Greece. His name was Anacarsis. Anacarsis was the son of a Scythian king, the brother of the prince, and of course this comes to 
Greece and um, uh, learns philosophy there and makes his way essentially back to uh, to Scythia afterwards and uh, uh, ends up there being killed by his brother because he's too Hellenized. His ways are too Greek uh, for the likes of the Scythians. And Acarsus, a philosopher, is not really the typical Scythian. His brother, the prince who decides to kill him, is a little bit more in line with what we know about Scythian culture. The Scythians were a warlike, uh, warlike tribe. Uh, they're essentially, we believe them to be the forebearers or the forefathers of the uh, uh, of the Huns, who lived also on the steppes of uh, of Central Asia. They are credited with being the first to actually develop the horse into a um, uh, into a weapon of war. And uh, beforehand, there were chariots. Horses were, of course, used. But to be just a, a rider alone on a horse, uh, that's something that the Scythians developed. They were extremely warlike. It's told that a woman was not able to be married. A Scythian maiden was not able to marry until she had killed at least three enemies in battle. So that must have been interesting. The Pasuk in... Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, Perk Dalid, Pasuk Yud Gimel, chapter 4, verse 13. Hinei ka'ananim ya'are v'chasufa markevotav, karu minisharim susav, oi lanu kishudadnu. For they approach us like the clouds, like a whirlwind, their chariots, their horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are ruined. Some of Farshim, some people believe that that is talking about the Scythians. Okay, so um, the Scythians actually had quite a cult around death. They were intrigued by death, and especially uh, the death of a prince or a king. When a king would die, every male had to pierce his hand through with an arrow and cut off a little piece of his ear. The uh, king would be mummified or the prince would be mummified and buried, but that wasn't the end of it. One year later on the anniversary of the, of the death, 50 of that king's best servants and 50 of his best horses would be strangled and they would be mummified and they would be positioned in a giant circular trench around the burial mound of the, of the prince, the king, stood up as if they were riding in battle, I guess protecting, if you will, the, uh, uh, the honor or the, or the king himself, the honor of the king or the king himself. And then all of this would be reburied in a giant mound. Now, these descriptions from Herodotus uh, were pretty much believed to be legendary or a little bit exaggerated until in the late 1940s, early 1950s, the great Russian anthropologist and archaeologist Sergei Rodenko actually uncovered these burial mounds known as kurgans. And Rudenko, whose career was to a certain extent uh, uh, catapulted by this discovery, uh, found these remains to be in unbelievable condition, excellent condition. And that was due to the fact that when these Scythians, this area uh, in the Altai Mountains, and the tribes, or this uh, era of tribes known as Pazara culture, the Pazara culture, when these these uh, princes and kings were buried just around 2,500 years ago, again in the 6th to 4th centuries BCE, the climate took a turn for a little bit colder. So these burial mounds were sealed and all the artifacts and people inside of them were sealed, buried, and then the ground turned to permafrost. 
So you have an unbelievable condition when these are excavated, not exposed to oxygen, completely sealed, and on top of that, frozen. I once saw a uh, National Geographic special where they show actually the unearthing, the uncovering of some of these, uh, some of these, um, they call them, I think, the Ice Princes of Pazric or the Ice Princes of, uh, of the Scythians. And you can actually see these, uh, uh, how, they, uh, how they excavated them and how they unearthed them. You can see that they're still encased in ice. The finds were in such good condition that some of the, of, of the mummified remains of the princes were still there, including the skin, and you can actually see the tattoos on the skin of these, uh, uh, of these dead kings. The, um, the Pazric remains and all the archaeological finds are still on display in the National Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, and if you go onto their site, you can actually see uh, a lot of the things from Pazric culture. Very, very important find. Uh, and what shows you is actually that Herodotus was not off, off base at all. He wasn't exaggerating at all. This was actually the way that these people lived. And, uh, uh, and a lot of what Herodotus said is actually borne out by the excavations of Rubenko. So one of the things, of course, that was unearthed in these uh, Pazric uh, tombs was this magnificent saddle cloth. And as we've seen, the, uh, uh, the tribes relied very much on their horses. And, uh, uh, and so a saddle cloth would have been an important adornment piece of jewelry that, uh, uh, that any king uh, would have certainly liked to have had. So let's hold off for a few seconds now with the Scythians and with Pazarek, and let's stop and see what was going on in Tanakh at this point. So in 612 BCE, the Babylonian king Nivo Plasar revolted against Ashur. And up until this point, Ashur, Assyria, are the absolute uh, dominant power in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, in the ancient Middle East. The Assyrians had an alliance with Egypt to the south, and uh, that alliance was essentially uh, the dominant power, the dominant force in the ancient Near East. And now, all of a sudden from the east, you have this threat coming from Bavel, coming from Babylonia, Nevo Plassar, who himself had been a general in the Assyrian army, revolts against Ashur, comes to fight against them in one of the most important battles uh, that was to determine the fate of the ancient world for the next hundreds of years, and this is the Battle of Karchemish, the Battle of Karchemish. 612, the forces are lined up. The Babylonians against Assyria and their allies, Egypt, are coming to fight on the banks of the Euphrates in Karchemish. The, um, the Assyrian king, uh, this, uh, his name is um, Ashur, Ashur Ubalit II, and his ally, the king of Egypt, Paronecho. Paronecho. Now, Paronecho was on his way up to join Ushur Ubalit at Karchemesh. When he was delayed, by of all people, Yoshiahu, Melech Yehuda, Josiah, the king of Judah, the king of uh, uh, the king of the Jews. Now, why did Yoshiahu do this? It's a, a, one of the unbelievable mistakes of history, but you can understand where he was coming from. Assyria is his enemy. Egypt, his enemy. And Bavel, who he knows nothing about, is the enemy of his enemy. And so Yoshio, against the advice of the Nevi'im, against the advice of the prophets and Yimiyahu, decides that he is going to uh, fight against Paro Necho as he's coming up from Egypt. And that way, uh, a 
essentially forges an alliance with the new general Nebuchadnezzar uh, and Babylonia, assuming that the enemy of my enemies must be my friend. Yoshiahu was fantastically unsuccessful in trying to defeat Paro Necho. That was the, uh, the devastating battle of Megiddo, of Armageddon, and Yoshio was, of course, killed in that battle. Paro Necho uh, was able to continue on to Karchemesh. However, Yoshio did succeed in delaying him. And because of that delay, Nebuchadnezzar was able to fight against Ashur, fight against Assyria alone, and defeated them. And when Paro Necho, Egypt, finally did make it up to Karchemesh, Nebuchadnezzar was able to divert all of his arms and attention to uh, and his resources to fight against Egypt and defeated Egypt. Who knows what would have happened if Paro Necho would have made it there on time, but we don't know that. We will never know. Nebuchadnezzar, who then goes back and uh, immediately becomes the king, Nebuchadnezzar Pasar died, and Nebuchadnezzar now becomes the absolute king and ruler of Babel. And the alliance, of course, between Yehuda and Babel was short-lived, although Yirmiyahu warns again and again and again, don't fight against Babylonia, don't fight against Babel, accept them, accept sovereignty, accept their, uh, their, their, their sovereignty over you, accept the rule of Babel. The kings of Yehuda do not listen to him, and eventually they revolt against Babel, and that leads to the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and the absolute destruction of Eretz Yisrael of Israel. But... Nebuchadnezzar was not alone in his battle against, in Kachamesh. It wasn't just Babel, because the Scythians joined with the Babylonians in fighting against the Assyrians. Now, it should be remembered that the Scythians actually came from Ashur in the 9th century. They broke off, the 9th century BC. They broke off and migrated to the northeast, to the steppes of Central Asia and to Siberia, and that's where they lived. But they had Assyrian roots and did not have a great love for their, uh, uh, where they came from, from the Assyrians. So the Scythians joined in with Nebuchadnezzar to fight at the Battle of Kachamesh. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar, as we said, destroyed the temple, destroyed all of Israel, and all of this is recorded in our Tanakh, in the Bible, the last chapter, basically the last sukim, the last verses in Divrei Amim, in the end of the end of, 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 of the Old Testament, the end of the Bible. Divrei Amim Bet, Perak Lamidvav, chapter thirty-six, pasuk Yud Zayin, verse seventeen. Vayal alehem et melech kastiim vayarov b'churehem b'cherev v'veit mitasham v'lo chamara b'chur b'tula zaken v'yashish akol matan biyado. And the king of the Kazdim, the king of uh, Babylonia, essentially came, killed all of the young people at, with his swords in their holy temple, Bevet Mikdasham, and had no mercy, Al Bachur B'Tulah had no mercy on the young man or the young maiden. Zakain V'Yashish, everyone, the elderly, the old men, the old women, were all given into his hand. I'll skip the next puzzle for a second, we'll come back to it. By Yisrafu at Beit HaElohim, and he burnt the house of God, the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, and destroyed uh, the um, walls of Jerusalem, and all of the palaces, she burned with fire, and he destroyed all of the vessels, all of the beautiful vessels. And he took everybody who was left the Sherit, the remnants, brought them back as slaves to Babylonia, and there they were until Babylonia eventually gave over to the Persian rule. Now let's go back to the Pasuk that I skipped. And this is Pasuk Yud Chet, verse 18. Let's read this carefully. And all of the kelim, all of the vessels of the Beit Elohim, of the Beit HaMikdash, of the House of God, Hagdolim v'Haktanim, those that were big, those that were small, the Beit Hashem, 
and the treasures of Beit Hashem, of the house of God, of the Beit HaMikdash, of the Holy Temple, the Otsrot HaMelech, and the treasures uh, of the king, the Sarav, the king and his, uh, and his princes and his, uh, and his generals, Hakol Hevi Babel, all of those were brought back to Babylonia. And this is how we have it recorded in our Tanakh, in our Bible. But there are parallels of exactly this that were recorded in the annals of Babylonia, uh, of Babel themselves. And on cuneiform tablets, we have this written down, which is exactly parallel to what we read in our, uh, in our Tanakh. But this, of course, was written down from the winner's side, from Nebuchadnezzar's side. And he is recording the history of his wars, or I should say the glorious um, conquests and victories. And here, what's written is, and I'll read it in English, purple and blue cloth was colored garments, I'm sorry, colored garments, linen stuffs, blue and purple stuffs. And when he says blue and purple stuffs, uh, those words are kitu, subatu, takiltu, subatu, agamanu, takiltu, and agamanu, which of course are the exact same words as what we have in Hebrew, techelet, techelet ve'argaman, which we know are purple wool and blue wool. Ushu wood, ukanu wood, everything costly from the royal treasure. So once again, what was brought back from uh, Jerusalem or from these wars, colored garments and linen stuffs, blue and purple stuffs, subatu takiltu, subatu argamanu, some woods, everything cost, costly from the royal treasure. And this, of course, is exactly what's written in the Tanakh, except in a little bit more detail. What were those things that were brought back from the Otsarot Beit Hashem, from the treasures of the Beit HaMikdash, and from the treasures of the, uh, of the, of the king, of the Otsarot HaMelech V'sarab? What we know in more detail is Tchayot and Now, up until now, everything that I've said to you is absolute fact. I have not uh, gone into any... Uh, uh, hasharot, any uh, suppositions, I'm not making any, uh, any assumptions, all of this is fact. From here, I'd like to connect the dots and offer at least a plausible explanation of what exactly happened with our beautiful Pazirik saddle cloth. Now once again, the facts of this saddle cloth are as follows. The wool is dyed with murex, we know that because of the presence of brominated molecules, which can be found only in dyes that come from shellfish and specifically from urex snails. They can't come from plants because plants will, uh, if there's plant indigo, uh, that would only have, uh, that would only have indigo, but it would not have any, uh, any of the brominated molecules. And as we uh, today have the capabilities with uh, very, very uh, sensitive instruments like, for example, uh, HPLCs, high-performance liquid chrom chroma chromatographs, uh, we can really do a very, very close analysis of what exists and what uh, trace elements, what elements exist there, and we see clearly that the brominated molecules exist. We know that these came from uric shellfish. And the other thing that we know, and this is extremely, extremely important for Tehillot, when you look at this, you can see that in the center you have this purple dye, purple blue, purple wool, right, a purplish blue. And then along the edge you have a pattern of sky blue, sky blue. According to our tradition, according to the Masoret, at least according to the Rambam of Sajagon, and this was accepted by many, many of the Poskim, many of the, many of the uh, Jewish legal authorities, the halachic authorities, Tichelet is the color of the sky in the middle of the day, beautiful sky blue, light sky blue. Although there are those that argue with it, Rashi, for example, says it's dark blue. But the most, most of the, uh, the Mufarshi, most of the Poskim, uh, uh, take the opinion and hold the opinion that Tchelet is light sky blue. What this shows us, this beautiful carpet from 2,500 years ago, in the times of the Nebuchadnezzar and Yoshiyahu, in the times of Shivat Zion, in the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, we have technologically the capabilities of 
dying with murex, dying with snails, and the dyers were extremely careful and knew how to control the hue and the color of the dye so that they could, if they wanted to, get a purplish dye out of those snails, out of the snails that came from the Mediterranean, and that we can see clearly in the middle of the pattern, but along the edge we see, in the beautiful sky blue, that they could control the dye process and get a color that was exactly the color of the sky, which we believe to be Tchelet. And so along the edges we would have Takiltu, Tchelet, and in the center we have Hagamanu, the purple blue, Hagamanu. And now let's just see if we can connect the dots in a way that's plausible. Nebuchadnezzar, when uh, he turned his wrath against Jerusalem and destroyed the Beit HaMikdash and fought against the Jews that were living in Israel at that time, killed them all out, and whoever he didn't kill, he brought back as slaves to Babel, to Babylonia, and along with that, all of the treasures of the Beit HaShem and the Beit HaMelech Vesara, all of the treasures from the Beit HaMikdash, from the Holy Temple, and from the palace of the king. Those treasures, as we've seen, were Tchelet and Argaman, the Tchelet that was used in the Holy Temple, in the garments of the priests, in the Big Dei Kiruna, in the Big Gadim of the Kohen Gadol, of the high priest, who wore a Me'il that was Kulo Tchelet, a, uh, a, 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 a apron, a vest that was all sky blue, a Ptil Tchelet, holding up the tzitz, a little string, or, a, a, or a, some sort of a, a ribbon of trelet, of blue, that held up the golden tzitz that hung on the, uh, on the high priest's forehead. Trelet was used in many of the bugadim of the high priest, and in uh, the bugadim of the, uh, of the regular priest, of the lay priest, of the kohen hejot, the regular uh, priest in his everyday garments had a sash of Tchelet that he wore a belt of Tchelet. Tchelet was used in these bagadim, in these priestly garments. Tchelet was used to adorn the walls of the Beit HaMikdash, of the Holy Temple. And Tchelet was, of course, very, very costly, and it was used by the princes and by the kings. And Mordechai Yatsa Milifnei HaMelech, and this is in Persia a little bit later, but Mordechai comes out, Mordechai Yatsa Milifnei HaMelech Belevush Malchut, in royal garments, in royal dress, Tchelet. He was wearing Tchelet. So, Nebuchadnezzar brings back this Tchelet from the Beit HaMikdash. At that point, in, ba in Babylonia, in Babel, he gives it to the royal weavers who take this Tchelet and Argaman and weave it into a magnificent saddle cloth. Nebuchadnezzar then gives this saddle cloth as a present to his colleague and ally, the prince of the Scythians, who had fought with him at Karchamesh and presumably also in Jerusalem, alongside Nebuchadnezzar, fighting sword to sword and hand in hand. As it's time for the prince now to return, Nebuchadnezzar gives him a beautiful present and what more magnificent than the blue and purple spoils from Jerusalem, from the Beit HaMikdash, and what more fitting to a Scythian warrior, prince, than a saddle cloth. The Scythians, who were known, uh, Homer calls them the horse milkers, right? These people who lived uh, with their horses and on their horses and fought with them and on them. Saddle cloth is given back to the Scythian prince, takes it back to the Altai Mountains in southern Siberia. There he dies. I'm sure, that was a hard day on the mountaintop there on the steps of uh, Central Asia on the plains when uh, all of uh, his uh, tribesmen had to pierce their arms and cut off their ears. He's dying as he's, as, he, as he's buried together with his beautiful saddle cloth that Nebuchadnezzar had given him. 2,500 years later, this beautiful saddle cloth is unearthed by Rodenko, and you look at it, and it still retains its magnificent luster, the hues of beautiful sky blue Tchelet and of purple Argaman are as vibrant and as clear um, and as fresh 
as the day that they were uh, that they were died on the shores of the Mediterranean 2,500 years previous. Uh, I think, I would like to believe at least that this is a plausible explanation. I would like to believe that the oldest Tchelet, or the oldest dye, dyed wool that was ever found, one of the oldest fabrics that was ever found, 2,500 years old, 2,500 years old, I would like to believe that Hakadosh Baruch Hu, that God kept that around for a reason and preserved it for some purpose. And what purpose could be more magnificent than to once again uh, bring to the light of uh, of the sun and to the eyes of his people, uh, to the eyes of the entire world, the tchelet that was uh, so. Uh, tragically taken from its rightful place in the Beit HaMikdash in the Holy Temple by the hands of the wicked Nebuchadnezzar and uh, wouldn't it be fitting if that same Tchelet has been preserved under the permafrost of Siberia for 2500 years and is now once again able to be seen and able to tell us actually what was the color of the ancient Tchelet what was the color of the ancient dye uh, that was used, uh, and uh, what is the color that we today should use uh, if we decide to uh, to put to put uh, sky blue strings uh, on our tzitzit, on our um, uh, on our garments today? This I believe to be true, but I am more and uh, only happy to hear your feedback and comments. If anybody would like to uh, to uh, let me know what you think, argue with me, uh, or or uh, tell me that uh, that there's something that uh, that you feel is correct or incorrect, please please be in touch with me. My email is baruch b a r u c h at techelet dot com t e k h e l e t dot com. Uh, look for more in the series of in depth lectures about topics relating to techelet, and uh, once again we welcome, eagerly await any feedback. Thank you.